We Are Creation from a Woman's Perspective with Bear Clan Mother Louise McDonald and St. Regis Mohawk Tribal Chief Beverly Cook is brought to you by the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, Ganungwe Council, and Ganyangahaga Unkwawana Latijokwa Language and Culture Center. Yes. My part of the presentation about how I look at the creation story goes a little bit deeper. And like Louise had said earlier, it's um, from a woman's point of view, it's from my point of view, how I envisioned this story one day when I had heard it for the hundredth time being told, um, I saw it a little bit differently. So since then, I've been using this story uh, in places like Ohologo, um, at the Partridge House, which is the Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center at Akwazasne. I teach it there. I teach it in the um, schools as well when I'm invited. And any, any old place I can get somebody to listen to me about this. So um, the story, I just wanted to do like a commercial in between where Sky Woman was falling, where Louise fell, um, left off, and to just describe some of the principles by which our communities um, functioned and our relationships between the man and the woman um, and, and the cooperation that took place inside of a village. And then later I'm going to relate that to how a man and a woman um, relate and how that affects life itself. So in the background, you can see the palisade um, that was built for protection of the village. And on the inside, the men who were also the architects and the builders are creating, making housing for the families. And we all know that the families were headed by the women, the matrons of the family. So in this particular longhouse, which could be 100 feet, 300 feet long, say that would be my mother's my mother's longhouse and I would live there with my husband and my daughters and their husbands and so on and any sons that are born into the family if they decide that they want to make a relationship with a woman generally would go and live in her longhouse and like that so inside of inside of the um, palisade life was pretty much run that way the women had certain authorities and certain responsibilities which gave them those, those authorities. And their responsibilities were taking care of the food, taking care of the gardens, taking care of the children, um, raising the children. And also along came with that, it, their position inside of our government structure where um, they selected chiefs, raised chiefs, and um, looked looked after them and how they t looked after the community. Um, on the outside, on the outside of that palisade was also the men's part of the world and they had really important responsibilities and um, one of them was hunting, bringing food back um, f to, feed the, to feed the families but also to protect the village from other uh, parties that might want to take our land, raid our gardens, whatever the, whatever the issue was at the time. And in later years, they even went further in traveling around the country, um, making relationships, making treaties, making agreements, making, um, uh, making relationships with other nations and utilizing them um, in ways uh, that you can read about that were protecting our, our villages and our confederacy. So there was uh, like a division of responsibility and power at that time. When I look at what the men had to do, it was so important because it enabled the women to be able to do what they were um, expert at doing at the time without having to fear that they were going to be raided or that something bad was going to happen or that they were going to run out of food. All those concerns and all those worries that she might otherwise have, the men were there to take care of that. So they depended on each other and one wasn't really more important than the other. They couldn't function, they couldn't function without each other. So I think there was a, you know, mutual respect and mutual regard in that way. 
but in order for any of them, they couldn't be out there hunting in the woods if they had to worry about the kids or worry about the gardens that they were going to not be well taken care of. So for each other's peace of mind, they worked together um, that way. So we left off where Sky Woman um, was falling. And as she was falling, after her encounter with the lacrosse player, uh, they say that underneath her was a world covered with water. And there were already creatures there who inhabited that world. So that as the story goes, the, the um, birds, the water birds that existed at that time saw her falling. And they weren't sure what it was at first, but it became apparent as she, as she continued to fall that whatever it was, it was alive. And as she got closer, it became apparent to them that she was pregnant and there was concern. They agreed to fly up, to span their wings, to catch her, cradle her, and bring her down to the surface of the water uh, gently so that she wouldn't be harmed. While they were thinking about that, though, the water creatures who were left below were wondering what was going to happen when she came to the water because the birds weren't going to be able to hold her up forever. And so the great sea turtle decided that she would volunteer and she would come to the surface and she would hold this woman on top of her back. There were smaller water creatures also that noticed how hard the shell of the turtle was and thought that maybe it would be better if there was some earth on top of the turtle's back. And they had heard about this earth um, from an old <coughs> grandfather who had told them way beneath the sea there would be some substance, some mud down there that they could um, gather and then put on top of the turtle's back. So they took turns doing that. The otter, they say, took, made an attempt, but his body floated up to the top. He drowned because it was so deep. And the beaver also, even though an excellent swimmer, went down to the bottom and his body also floated to the top because it was so deep and he drowned. Pretty soon the muskrat decided that he would give it, give it a whirl and he went down to the bottom of the ocean and his body too floated up to the top. But when they rolled him over, they saw that there was a little bit of mud in his mouth and a little bit of mud in his paws. And so they took that mud and um, put it on top of the turtle's back. Now one of the things that this um, painting by John Thomas reminds me of is that when she fell through that hole, she also tried to save herself. And she grabbed onto the edges of that hole, trying to stop herself from falling. And what she came away with was some of that dirt that was underneath that tree of life, that celestial tree. And inside of that dirt that she clutched in the palms of her hands were seeds from that tree, which also had blossoms and berries. And some say it was full of medicines um, that she brought with her. So when she found herself in this predicament, and because of the upbringing that she'd had, apart from the village, learning the songs, learning the ceremonies, learning our cosmology, learning the language, learning the medicines. She had to pull all of that knowledge that she was fortunate enough, enough to learn and bring it to, bring it to uh, bear at this point because her life depended on it and the life that she was carrying depended on it. So this is a depiction from an artist from back home, Goizodo <coughs> Mark Light, and here it's difficult to see in the, in the shadows, but on top of that turtle's back is that mud that's starting to spread on top of the turtle's back. And she's commencing to use what she knows, the songs that she knows, and being able to shuffle her feet, just like the women do when they do the woman's dance. They shuffle their feet across the floor. She's shuffling her feet across the top of that turtle's back. And the mud that she stepped onto, that the little water creatures uh, retreat for her starts to spread and as it starts to spread the back of the turtle starts to spread and as she's dancing the dirt that she has clutched in the palms of her hands with those seeds from where she came start to crumble and they mix with the mud from the bottom of the ocean and it starts to grow even further and out of that mud starts to spring some of those seeds 
those plants from the seeds from where she came. And in this picture, you see the strawberry, you see the sunflower, which for a period of time here um, emanated the light before there was a sun. They say that the sunflower um, filled that role. And on the left is uh, the red willow. So there were medicines that came with her. And the songs that she used, they say, are some of those older seed songs that we sing um, at seed, seed planting time. So she sang those songs about life, about gratitude, about growth, and um, things started to expand. Eventually, she had the conditions that she required in order to give birth um, to what turned out to be a daughter. And her name is Yagojijide. And um, because these people, I would call them spiritual beings more than people, because we're not really sure what they looked like or how they functioned, but we know that there was a female spirit that was born and then later um, she struck up a relationship with the spirit of the West Wind and gave birth to twins. And the twin boys went on to um, create everything that you see on top of the foundation that was created by their mother, their grandmother, so to say. So then I started thinking while I was listening to this story being told, Everything that they continued to talk about in terms of what the twins did, though it's very important, I got stuck on this part. And I started to think about what they were really saying about Sky Woman's journey and how every woman is a part of that journey. She is that journey. We all, men and women alike, make that journey with her all the time. And this is why I was thinking about that in that way. Little girls who are inside of their mother's womb, so all of the women in here were daughters. How many have daughters? So a lot of us have daughters. So those little girls inside of their mother's womb already have their ovaries. <coughs> and inside of their ovaries, is the substance, these little buds, that are going to become the eggs that she's going to use for the rest of her life. She doesn't get any more. She doesn't get extra. She doesn't replace them. What she has when she's born is all she's ever going to have. That's why it's so devastating if a woman loses an ovary or something happens to her. Um, ability to have kids, it's very devastating because she can't make more. Boys, on the other hand, men, on the other hand, make sperm every other day. And they make a lot, like <laughs> a lot, like 500 million, like a lot. So it's a different way of thinking. If you're born and, you're, and your body is built to make babies and what you have to use to make your babies is all you're going to get, then you want to be really protective of them. But if you make brand new sperm every other day, that you might not think about it in the same way. So maybe you tend to take some things for granted, but women have to think about it a different way. So that's one of the important things about why in our teachings they say to respect women, how to treat them. So how do you respect women? Make sure they have what they need. Make sure they're not worried. Make sure they're not scared make sure they're not hurt, make sure they're fed well, make sure they're happy like that. Think about them, give them a seat. If there's no place to sit, you get up and give them a seat. So you, you, you teach that way, but it's not just because you were told you have to, it's important to understand why, because you're treasuring what she brought from another place from inside of her mom's body, these, this ability to bear life was with her even before she was born. So it's, it's really important. So we treat them like treasures. 
the treasures that they are. So this is a difficult picture to see, but it's a picture of my, my mother. She's 90 now. And then there's a picture of me and a picture of my daughter and a picture of my granddaughter and my other two daughters. And the reason I put them up there is because I'm going to talk to you about something else about life and why women are so important to life because it's not just their ability to get pregnant and it's not just their ability to give birth and it's not just their ability to be able to breastfeed and sustain life. It's because they are life and this is why. So this is a cell and it could be a heart cell or a muscle cell or a brain cell or hair or skin, kidney, liver, any kind of cell. And inside of your cell, there's a nucleus. That's the green part with the X's inside. And that has DNA in it. They call it nuclear DNA. And it's what tells your cell what it is. It tells it that you're not a brain cell, you're a muscle cell. And you're not a hair cell, you're a skin cell. So that's what tells the cell what it is. And that DNA comes from your mother and your father. So we can tell who your parents are by looking at your nuclear DNA. Well, we can also tell who your mother is because that other orange thing inside of there is called the mitochondria. And in science terms, the mitochondria is the furnace of the cell. It takes what you eat and it turns it into energy and it gives the cell life. So without your mitochondria, the cell shrivels up and dries up and blows away like dust. It can't exist without the mitochondria. So it's like a fireplace. Um, it has energy. It has a force. It has a life essence. That's what that mitochondria is. The mitochondria has its own DNA and that DNA comes from the mother, only the mother. Not only does it come from the mother, but every man and woman in this room, your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother and it's also the exact copy of your grandmother's mitochondrial DNA. And it's, so your mother's DNA is the exact copy of her mother's and her mother has the exact copy of her mother. So that means that your great, 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 great grandmother's mitochondrial DNA is the exact same as yours. So you're connected all through that time. She's giving you life still. And without that, you don't live. That's why you make sure that you don't hurt her and that's why you talk to her nice and you make her feel important because she is important. So all the sons have the same mitochondrial DNA as their mother, but they're not able to pass that on because it's only the mother's DNA that operates that mitochondria. Pretty awesome, huh? So take a moment to be proud of yourselves, ladies. It's really powerful, especially when you think about your relationship with your grandmothers and as far back as you can go, how close they are to you. So don't get scared, but I'm going to start talking about where creation is really at. So this is the surface of an ovary, and this is an egg that's popping out of the ovary. That's at the time that we call ovulation. And when that happens, and this woman has intimacy uh, or sex, with a man, <laughs> it's not always the same thing. <laughs> so I need to be more explicit. <laughs> um, you can hug and be intimate, right? It doesn't have to be sex. But in case for this to get fertilized, you have to have sex. So this is ovulation. This is when the egg um, erupts from. So that crater that's formed. To me, that's like Sky Woman. Like the bird's wings. 
Microscopic cilia on the Fimbriae surface transport the egg to the entrance of the fallopian tube. Inside the walls of the fallopian tube, muscular contractions gently push the egg towards the uterus. Her fall. After ovulation, the egg lives for 12 to 24 hours, so it must be fertilized by a sperm from the male during this time for a woman to become pregnant. If it's not fertilized, the egg dissolves away and is shed along with the uterine lining during menstruation. So that journey is just like Sky Woman's journey. That crater that's left in the ovary, the ovary doesn't die, but there's a crater that's created that the egg erupts through, falls into blackness, is picked up by the fallopian tubes, or the fimbriae on the end of the fallopian tubes, and travels through the fallopian tube into the uterus, where it takes hold. So this is the story. Um, vag vagina here, this is the opening to the uterus, and this is called the cervix. This is the inside of the uterus, the womb. They call it the uterine cavity. And this here and here, that's all muscle. It's the strongest muscle in a woman's body because it has to push a baby out. These are the fallopian tubes, and this is the ovary. And you can, it's hard to see from this picture, but the ovary and the egg are not, I mean, the ovary and the fallopian tube are not connected, just like you saw in the video. But there's these finger-like projections here that move, and they coax that little egg to it, and it travels through the fallopian tube. So around the time of puberty, and, there, and then f during each monthly cycle, hormones work on th the woman's body. And remember that these little ovaries have been there since before she was born, and now these little um, bodies inside of the ovary, when they're affected by the hormones of the woman, um, start to mature and start to get bigger. And they, f they and, um, are encapsulated inside of a bubble. The bubble gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches the surface of the ovary, and just like you saw in the video, it bursts. And the egg falls through and gets picked up by the fallopian tube and travels through the fallopian tube. It takes five days for that egg to travel through the fallopian tube. So this process takes time. And it's going on, usually inside of your body, every single minute of every single day. So this doesn't just happen or start two days before your moon time comes, and it doesn't start um, the day after. It's every day. Every day it's going on. A piece of it is happening. So like they said in the video, if the egg is not fertilized, then it washes away. But um, while this process is happening, the body is saying, if we don't put something softer on the surface of that muscle, when that egg reaches there, if it's fertilized, it's just going to bounce around inside of the uterine cavity. It can't, um, it can't um, embed itself and it can't grow. So if you have a garden or if you walked outside and you just threw some seeds out there and thought they were going to grow, there's very few plants that are going to grow like that. Usually you have to do what? Plow up the dirt. Yeah, you have to work the soil. You have to get your tiller out. You have to get it ready. And then you throw your seeds on there and then you cover them up. It's like a nice soft blanket and then everything starts to grow. It's the same thing inside of the woman's body. So the body creates a lining, a soft cushion on the inside of her body while this is all going on. So it's ready by the time the egg gets there in case it's fertilized. If it's not fertilized, the video said um, the egg dissolves, the lining dissolves, and then you have your moon time. And then the process starts all over again immediately. You don't get a rest. Your body is working all the time. Now, say that uh, it does get fertilized. And what do you have to do to get a fertilized egg? Have sex. <laughs> okay, so one sperm is going to fertilize the egg, even though 
It took 500 million. Only one is going to make it. No. One. Okay, 500 million. They're not all going to make it up through there, are they? So then they have to swim all the way up here. And then, oh, I forgot to tell you, you only, you only ovulate from one side at a time. So this month, you ovulate from over there. Next month, you ovulate from over here. Next month, over there. Next month, over here. So it's a guessing game for the sperm to figure out which way to go. So some are going to go the wrong way, and some are going to go the right way. And then they have to swim all the way up the fallopian tube. And then they all wait however many. Now, you started with 500 million. You're probably going to end up with maybe 100,000. That's why you start out with so many, because it's a long journey. And they wait on the outside. There's a chemical event that happens, and that all of a sudden they make a mad dash, and only one sperm makes it. So if fertilization takes place, the DNA from the head of the sperm and the DNA that's inside of the egg combine together, and they mix. And then they start to separate. So instead of one cell, you get two cells, then you get four cells, then you get eight cells, 16 cells, uh, 32 cells, and so on. So the, it keeps dividing until it implants inside of the uterus. And then it still keeps dividing and changing, but in a different way. So that journey, to me, is the same journey that Sky Woman makes. One of the things that's going on while it's traveling through the fallopian tube is it's getting messages from the mother about what her nutritional status is. So if she is in good health and has good nutrition, then the egg is relieved or the, the, um, the zygote that's traveling through the fallopian tube is relieved because it gets to use a bunch of cells and it makes its heart and its brain and its liver and all that stuff out of those cells. But if she's not in good nutritional shape, then they have less nutrition to work with and it's going to divide the cells up a little bit differently. So the brain is going to get the cells it needs, but there might not be so many cells for the heart or the liver might get less or the pancreas might get less and so on. So it's a really complicated thing. And I can't stress enough what a miracle any of us got born is because of all the things that could go wrong in the meantime. So um, it's, it's, really, it's really quite a thing. Okay, so back to these guys. So the reason I put them up there is because sometimes a lot of emphasis is put on what the mother does, what the mother sees, like during pregnancy, she can't look at certain things, she can't go certain places, she shouldn't drink, right? Shouldn't be smoking, shouldn't be using drugs, um, and all of that. But the men also have a part to play in that. And one of the things I wanted to say about this is, so girls are brought with their DNA, with their eggs from the time they're born, right? The boys start making their DNA and their sperm at the time of puberty. So how, how a woman is treated during her pregnancy, especially when she's carrying a girl, matters and how that baby puts itself together because the baby's putting itself together based on the information it gets from the mother about how much food is out there. Is it hostile out there or is everybody, is it a, a safe place to be? Depending on what her experiences are. So for the DNA of the boys, that time is critical around puberty, how boys are handled, how they're talked to, how they're treated, how they're made to feel, can determine how the DNA is formed on their sperm. And I'll talk a bit, little bit more about that later. So anyway, <clears throat> so now because you make sperm every other day or so, what you do every other day or so matters on the quality of the sperm. <clears throat> So if you're eating well and you're well hydrated and you exercise and you're not stressed and you get enough sleep, 
then you're doing everything you can to be healthy, then you're going to make the best sperm possible. And it's important because if you're smoking weed, we know that you don't make as much sperm as you should or could or would if you weren't. If you're using cocaine, we know that cocaine rides into the pregnancy on the head of the sperm. So there's impacts on how those babies develop um, because of that. So, and the other reason is, is that you want these to be perfect, healthy sperm because they got a long way to go, right? And out of 500 million, you're going to end up with about 100,000 that are going to com be competing to, to um, create a life. So you want it to be the best that you got. And the girls want it to be the best that you got. So you need to take care of yourself. And the girls need to be critical about what kind of guy they want to make a baby with because they want that baby to have the best chance ever. So sometimes, um, sometimes sperm have no tails, which means they can't swim anywhere. Sometimes they're made with two, and this is normal. This is not, you know, like if you're messing up or anything, this is like normal. So some might have two tails, some might have two heads, some have one short tail or one long tail or no head. And so there's all different ways that your sperm could be. But what you want is if you take care of yourself, that the odds that you're going to have more healthy, handsome sperm are better than if you don't take care of yourself. All right, so there's responsibility on both sides. There's nothing in creation that's really lopsided. So this is three days. The cells are multiplying, and it's still in the fallopian tube. This is five days. It's starting to look a little bit different, but it's still in the fallopian tube. This is at about eight weeks. So you already have organs starting to form and so on. It's starting to really take shape. And at this point, the mother has this feeling that um, maybe she's sick all the time or maybe she's really tired, um, can't get out of her own way, feeling maybe more emotional than usual. There, but there's some kind of communication going on between this, um, this life and, um, and herself. So right around uh, six months, 24 weeks, while the mom is feeling a certain way because of the pregnancy, the baby up until now is getting messages from the mother. So if the mother is calm and being taken care of and all her needs are being met and she's very content, everything's good. If she's not, if she's fearful, if she's afraid, if she's in a violent relationship, if her if the father of the baby or her partner is out till all hours of the night and she doesn't know where he is, then she's worried. Then she's scared. Then she wonders where he is or is he hurt or is he coming back or who is he with. All kinds of things can go through her mind. And while she's doing that, sitting by the window waiting for whoever to come home, her heart might be racing. She's getting fretful. She might be crying. She might be anxious. She might be angry. Now she's really mad by the time they hit the door, and then there's a big fight. And so if there's a big fight and it ends up in a violent encounter, that mother's um, adrenaline and cortisol levels mm -hmm. are sky high, and they can, be, they can be affecting the way the baby feels. So the baby's getting the effects of the adrenaline. The baby's getting the effects of the cortisol. And this baby is just trying to grow. It's just trying to grow. So around six, um, six months, the baby can hear. It has ears now. So it can hear the mother's heartbeat, can hear her breath. It can hear her voice, hear her stomach gurgling, hear other people talking to her or yelling at her or screaming at her, whatever the case may be, and the baby can hear it. And we know that the baby can hear it because there's been studies done of newborns being held by their mother in a room full of people all talking and chattering away. And the father comes in the room and the father starts talking and the baby will turn his head towards the father's voice. So we know that there's a relationship that's been built during the time of the pregnancy, if he's around. 
And so that's why our teachings say no hunting. You need to take care of her. You need to meet her every need. She needs to feel safe. Just like in the old days, the men's responsibility was to make the woman feel safe so that she could go about her business of growing her garden, raising her children. It's the same need that is present when a woman is pregnant. She needs to be able to grow that baby or have an environment, create an environment where that baby can grow without any fear or any interruption in their normal <coughs> process. So they tell the men when a woman's pregnant, no hunting. You don't want to be taking a life while you're making a life. But you also want to be present. And there's all kinds of reasons why that is because of the bonding with the baby and the relationship with the mother and trying to take care of whatever it is that she needs you to do. Um, there's all kinds of teachings for the women when they're pregnant. And we already went through no drinking, no smoking. But there's other things like don't go behind the barn when they're butchering the pig. Uh, can't go to Hadoui ceremony. Don't go down to that car accident. Um, don't be standing in the window and looking outside or don't stand in the doorways. You need to go outside and um, no looking out the windows, go outside and see what it is that you want to see. And all of that, my, my, um, my oldest daughter's uh, grandmother would tell me, because you want your labor to go good, you don't want the baby to get stuck. You want everything to go just right. So she was constantly reminding me of the condition I was in and how to look ahead to how I wanted it to be. So nowadays, they call that visualization. And they do it to cure disease. They do it to help make people feel better. But our grandmothers told us all that stuff long time ago about how to think about your birth. Think about 10, ten toes, 10 fingers, two eyes, two ears, their lungs, all their internal organs, everything should be just right. So we were constantly reminded about how to think about it, that where we were at and where our babies were at, it required prayer because we can't take anything for granted knowing what you know now about the million things that could have gone wrong for this baby to get to get created. So then the baby gets born. And we've only just begun. All of that responsibility just gets way bigger. And how we react, how we interact with our babies is really important. The men do the best they can, right? They don't exactly know how to swaddle or how to hold the baby's head, right? But they do, they do, they try hard. <laughs> but it, it also goes to the um, duality that uh, Louise had talked about earlier. Yeah, babies need to be um, bundled up and they need to feel safe and all that, but they also need to know um, their body and what their body is capable of and to feel uh, different things. And so how men interact with our children and how we interact with our children, there's, there's a balance mm -hmm. and it, it can be um, a healthy balance. So now I'm just gonna, um, go into something a little bit different about um, childhood uh, development and some of the uh, realities that we deal with today. And um, it, it can get a little bit uh, emotional. So I just want to um, prepare you ahead of time that we're switching gears. So now we're hoping that everything has gone just the way we wanted it to go. And everything that that baby is getting from its mother is telling them, is it, okay out there? Is it safe out there? Is it going to be fun when I get there? Or is it going to be really scary and I need to be a certain way? And based on that information, that's how the baby's going to construct um, itself. So when babies are growing, their brains are still developing, right? So girls' brains are completely developed, fully mature, usually around age 18. So when do you think the men or the, the boys brains are completely developed? 25, 26. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in some cases. So it's important to know that because we know that when people get mixed up with addiction, 
uh, the younger they are, they get involved in it, the harder it is for them to get over it because their brains are still growing. And so you're throwing chemicals in there that are going to interfere with the way the baby um, or the baby, the child or the young person, the adolescent develops and the harder it is for them to recover from their addiction. So thinking about that, <coughs> this is um, my youngest grandson and we took him to a pumpkin farm and does everybody see the face on the tree? Yeah. And it, when you walk by it, it triggers it and it starts laughing and cackling and it startles you if you don't realize it's there. So we all thought it was funny. We went, whew, you know, and walked by and he walked by it and it started doing that and he froze. We didn't realize it until we turned around and looked and he was still stuck there with that look on his face. <laughs> So somebody went over and said, it's okay, it's just a toy, it's not real. And so we showed him how it worked. And then pretty soon he was running in front of it and it was all okay. So that's, that's a good thing. But what about if that's the father? What about if that's a scary teacher that they have to encounter every day? What if it's the bully that they encounter every day? What if it's their mom or somebody else close to them in their family? What if this is every day? What if it's multiple times a day? What if it's every Friday or every Saturday night when the parents come home and they've been out partying or whatever and then that, that child has to go through that? So this is a natural response. When we, get, when we come up against something that startles us or scares us, uh, we go into a fight or flight response. But there's also another response and it's called freeze. And if you look in nature, um, if you walk through the woods and all of a sudden, you know, a rabbit pops out in your path and the rabbit is going zigzagging all over the place and then all of a sudden it freezes. So if, there, if a rabbit is in tall grass or in the woods, that's probably a good thing because it's like camouflage and maybe the predator can't see it. But if he's in an open, green, grassy, well-kept lawn and stops dead in his tracks, whatever it is, the family dog or whatever, can very well run up on it and kill it. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's meant to work because they're supposed to be in their own natural environment. It's the same way when you're driving down the road and you're driving along, all of a sudden there's these red lights and sirens behind you. What do you do? Yeah, right. You're <laughs> digging in the, in, the, in the glove compartment to see if the registration's there. You're digging through your purse, throwing it all over, thinking, what am I looking for? I don't even have a license. So I'm in so much trouble. And so your, your hands are sweating, your heart is beating, your eyes are dilating, your respirations are up, you're just, and you're kind of frozen. And then all of a sudden, the cop car just goes by you and keeps on going. <laughs> and then you go, oh, holy man, that was a good thing. I'm going to get my car registered next week. <laughs> so you're, you're all good. So that's, a, re that's a, a recovery response. That's the recovery response. And that's normal. And that's what he felt when we said, oh, it's just a, it's fun. It's the toy. So he felt that recovery. So that's normal. But if you're constantly in fight or flight, or you can't fully recover, or you just get over one thing and then you're into another thing, or it's, you never know when it's going to happen, then that's when you meet the people that are on edge all the time. The people that, you know, you, set, you, you throw a book on the, on the counter and they jump and they just about hit the ceiling. Or you come around the corner and they, they scream when they see you. They're in a constant um, fight or flight response. So that's not, we can handle it because we're fully developed, right? But at this age, when their brains are still developing up until the age of 25 and 18, we're interrupting the way the neural pathways are being laid down, especially between the ages of um, birth and three and up to six. We're really um, inter interrupting the natural flow of things. 
And then the brain is continuing to develop based on what the experiences are after that. So this is a normal brain. And this is a brain, this is a three-year-old. And this is a three-year-old of a, of a little boy that's been severely neglected. So we get to a point where all these neural pathways are laid down, they're firing. He's getting what he needs, he's getting input, he's loved. Somebody is noticing him, he feels important. This little guy over here isn't getting much of anything in terms of recognition or acknowledgement. And so those parts of his brain that deal with emotion are dark. He's not getting any input on what does that mean? How does that feel? So, and also the whole size of the brain is smaller. So we can impact, if we don't pay attention to how we're raising our kids and how we're treating them or how other people are treating kids, then we can do actual damage to the development of their brain. Now, the other thing that I wanted to tell you about, I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. I want to talk about um, adverse childhood experiences. A study was done in uh, the late 1990s by two physicians. They did um, this study on mostly white people. Um, there was 70% Caucasian, 10% Hispanic, and 10% black, and there were a few natives in there. And um, they did um, 17,000 of them. And they gave them a questionnaire and asked them about their childhood experiences. And it included 10 things, like if you were emotionally neglected or physically neglected, um, emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused. Um, if there was somebody in the family that was an alcoholic or drug addict, somebody had been incarcerated, somebody had um, depression or mental health issues, parents were divorced, and I think somebody might have committed suicide, something like that in the family. So there were 10 categories. And so they asked them, had this ever happened to you? Like, were you ever repeatedly beaten? Or were you, um, between the age of zero and 18, were you ever abused in any kind of way? And there were specific questions about what kind of abuse. So if that ever happened to you, or did your parents ever separate or divorce before you were 18, that would be a score of one. Um, was there somebody who was an alcoholic in your family? That would be a score of two. Was anybody ever incarcerated? That would be a score of three, and so on. So they called that your A score. And what they found out was that whether you had those three that I just mentioned, or if you had sexual abuse and, oh, witnessing your mother being physically abused was the other one. So if you um, were sexually abused, saw your mother being physically abused, and somebody went to jail, and the other three that I mentioned about alcoholism and s such, that this one was not worse than this one. Even sexual abuse wasn't worse than being emotionally ne neglected or like that. So basically, they all carried the same weight. There was one that did have a little bit stronger impact, and that was the emotional um, abuse. So being called down by your parents or being called names or made to feel bad or shamed and all that had a little greater effect, but otherwise they were all equal. So those are adverse childhood experiences, things that happened to you that made you feel <coughs> not good or not, um, not good enough. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm a weirdo or I'm, I'm just not worth anything. Um, being fearful, being, um, being on guard all the time, so on and so forth. So you have these adverse childhood experiences. Well, now I've already told you that it can disrupt neural development, right? Depending on what happens with these kids over and over, we can change the way their brains develop. So that's disrupted neural development. And then they can have social, emotional, cognitive impairments. That means if their brain is smaller, then the, tele the IQ goes down a little bit. So they might have trouble in school. Maybe their parents are still acting up and when they're, they're worried about when they go home from school, is there going to be any food in the house? Or is there going to be anybody home? 
or is there going to be a party going on when I get there? So how are they going to concentrate in school if they're worried about what's happening at home? Um, socially, they might be acting out, getting in trouble at school all the time. You know, they're getting detention or getting thrown out of school. Things are going wrong. So you're feeling pretty crummy. And what do we want to do when we feel crummy? What do we want? We want to feel better. Yeah. We want to feel better. We want to be happy. And so we start doing things that make us happy. And usually for little kids, that means stealing somebody's cigarettes and learning how to smoke <laughs> because their friends do it. But then they find out that the nicotine makes them feel better. And the reason is, is because the nicotine actually calms anxiety. And they were going to use nicotine as a medicine um, several decades ago, but it had too many side effects, so they didn't. They were going to use it as an antidepressant, but they couldn't. So that's why when people smoke, and if you smoked, you know the relief when you haven't had it or there's something crazy going on and you light up that cigarette, it's like instant relief. So alcohol, drugs, overeating, eating lots of chocolate, eating lots of pasta, raging. Sometimes people go out and pick a fight. They go out, they get have a few, pick a fight, have a knockdown drag out, and they feel better. Sometimes they go home and they raise heck with all the family. They get after the mother, get after the kids, domestic violence. They come out of there, they feel better for a little while, and then they feel like crap after. And then there's this big cycle that goes on. But they start adopting behaviors that they think are going to make them feel better. It's not because they want to hurt anybody. It's because they can't, in the moment, can't restrain themselves. It's not because they meant to get loaded, but they did. And eventually, as they seek out these things that, try to, that they're using to make themselves feel better, they get hooked, they get stuck on it, they get, um, they get in trouble. And then we're up to disease and disability and social problems because of it. So you do it enough, it becomes a regular um, self-treatment of whatever is bothering you and pretty soon you lose your wife or you lose your husband or you lose your job or you spend all your money or any kind of thing. You, you get in a fight with your best friend and you lose a childhood friend for forever. So things like that can go on. Um, or if you started smoking when you were 10, uh, you might develop lung disease later on. Or you're overeating, you get high blood pressure, you get diabetes and um, heart disease. Or, you know, you're drinking and driving and you get in a car crash and then uh, you lose use of one of your limbs or both and now you have a disability because of it. It's not that people go out and say, I want to get in a wreck tonight. Or that they go out and say, I'm going to go have some brews and then I'm going to go home and I'm going to beat the wife. They don't do that. Women don't drink because they want to damage the baby that they're carrying. They don't say, I'm going to have some beers and I'm going to give this baby brain damage. They don't do that on purpose. They do it because they don't want to feel the way they're feeling right now. They want to fix it and they want it to go away. And because of that, many of the people that are in that boat end up um, not living as long as they probably would have if they hadn't done all of that. So that's what the ACE study measured. And this is kind of how it looks at home when it's going on. And so we don't know how that baby's feeling, but they're like pretty much into it, the mother and the father. And so th whatever their experiences were that they're trying to deal with is now becoming that little boy or that little girl's ace. Their adverse childhood experience is sitting at the kitchen table watching their parents fight every night. So now you've got... Um, experiences and how it makes you feel and you have how what you're experiencing affects the way that your brain develops and this I'm just quickly going to go through is um, um, epigenetics and the, the research that's been done shows that um, there used to be some debate about <coughs> the way that people behaved whether it was their nature or whether it was because of the way they were nurtured. 
And so now we know that it has more to do with how nurturing affects nature. And so they did studies on rat pups and how nurturing mothers um, create uh, babies. They get a lot of lick, you know, licking, uh, grooming, um, and attention, and they grow up to be able to handle stress very well. But if they were raised by mothers who didn't groom them or didn't give them much attention, these little rat pups couldn't um, handle stress very well. And so they thought, well, maybe that has to do with this mother being just a neglectful mother, and that's how the kids are. Um, but then they gave them over to nurturing mothers and switched and took um, rat pups from good moms and gave them the bad moms and it didn't turn out well for them. And um, so anyway, it's just more common sense that, that we would already know that science is finally catching up to. But the one that I find, um, but it, I, I just want to say that it is the reason why um, they try to intervene when there are children who aren't being treated very well. They try to intervene sooner than later. Um, because of the benefits that can um, um, be handed down to the, to the children if it is not too late um, for them to be able to have a better view of the world. So the one um, study that I was really interested in was the rat pups that um, normal, normal rat pups, they took the males and they let them smell peach blossoms. And after they let them smell the peach blossoms, they gave them a little shock on the foot. And the little rats got scared and ran into the corner and were obviously um, afraid and shaken. So the following day, they did the same thing. They let the rat pups smell the peach blossoms, and then they gave them a shock on the foot, and they went running into the corner. So they repeated that uh, about five times. And they stopped shocking them. And they just gave them the peach blossom smell. And what do you think they did? They ran into the corner because they were scared. And they repeated it. No shocks anymore, just the peach blossoms. And every time they smelled the peach blossoms, they ran into the corner. So they took those male rats and let them mature. And then they mated them with normal females. And they had a litter. And they took the little male pups. And they gave them peach blossoms to smell. And guess what they did? they ran into the corner and they'd never been shocked and so they repeated it and repeated it and every time they smelled the peach blossoms they ran into the corner even though they'd never been shocked so they let them grow up and they mated them with normal female rats and they had a litter and they took the little male pups and they let them smell peach blossoms and what do you think happened they ran into the corner even though they had never been shocked and nobody in their family had been shocked for two generations. So they started to understand that the experiences of the male pups, because they did it around that time in a human being, it would have been around the time of puberty for the boys, they experienced something and that experience got transmitted down to their grandsons. So they know now that that fear response is, ha is on the head of the sperm or coded into the head of the sperm at the time and enters um, conception at the time of fertilization. That fear response is there. And they believe the same thing for women. They haven't quite pinpointed it yet, um, but it would have to be around the time that the mom was in the mother's womb because that's when that code is laid down on her parts of the DNA while she's still in the womb. And maybe it's later, too. We're not, I'm not sure. Um, I would have to look into that more. But the last I had read, they weren't quite sure about where that happens inside of the mom. But those critical times are for women while they're inside of their mother's womb. That w even their mother's nutritional status, now they know. The mother who's carrying the little girl, that that little girl's granddaughters have a higher tendency towards um, diabetes, say, depending on what the mother's nutrition, the grandmother's nutritional status was. So we're finding that those things are being handed down through the generations on top of the genes. 
So epigenetics means that it's a change on top of the gene. The DNA code, the DNA code is the same. It's the way that the genes express themselves that's different. And that can be affected in the womb or at critical times during um, a person's life. So with boys, they did a study on, um, in, in Sweden there was a famine and they took the, the boys that were at the age of puberty and the girls who were still in their mom's womb and they tracked their grandchildren and they found a distinct pattern between the boys who were um, at puberty going through this famine. The boys that didn't have a lot to eat during the famine, their grandsons had a longer life expectancy um, through two, two generations later. Their grandsons had a higher, a longer life expectancy. The boys who at the time of puberty were going through this famine, their grandsons had a higher rate of, a higher prevalence of um, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and didn't have as long of a life expectancy. The girls who were in their mom's womb at the time, um, depending on their mother's nutritional status, it was a similar outcome. So they, f they were pretty sure that they're now being able to say for sure that things that are experienced by the grandparents can be handed down to the grandchildren. And maybe some of those things can go even further. So it gets important when you had um, raised the issue about the boarding schools and what the experiences were of those little kids. And you look at these two little ones up here, they're probably, I don't know, I don't even know if they're two. They look really little that were taken. And um, I think this was at Thomas Indian School. I know there were different boarding schools up in the Northern Territories, um, but a lot of our kids got sent to Thomas Indian School or they got sent some that lived in on the northern portion of Akwazasne got sent to like the mush hole and that. But a lot of them, the older ones, got sent down to Pennsylvania to Carlisle. So now you know about how the ACE study works. And if you think about what the ACE scores could be of these children, so not only did they lose a parent to separation or to divorce, they lost both parents. Not only did they lose their parents, but they lost their brothers and sisters, their aunts and uncles, their grandparents, their language, their identity, anything they knew that was part of who they were was gone. That's got to be like an A score of 25 right there. Not to mention if they were emotionally neglected or physically neglected or abused or sexually abused or all those other things that happened to them while they were there. So their A scores are probably extremely high. And for the ones that were abused, then how was their brain development? How was the laying down of their neural pathways affected by the things that happened to them while they were in boarding school? And how were their epigenetics changed while they were undergoing all of that treatment? And how did it affect them later on in life? So, this was a real um, catastrophe that happened to our people. And I know that it's a big, you know, we, we want to blame it all on the boarding schools, but I think it was even before then. Because we were on the move. Our environment was changing and not always in a good way. Our lifestyles were changing, our, um, the fabric of our, of our communal life and our government and everything that we knew was changing rapidly and um, fathers were going to war, fathers were fighting the, with the British, they were fighting with the French, all kinds of things were going on. We were, it was not all peace in the valley up until the boarding school happened. We have had one thing right after another happening and even to today we still have stuff that happens to us because of this. Because the effects that um, our people have suffered as children and the way that it affected our development and our thinking and the way we feel, we compound it. 
So then they come home from boarding school and they don't know how to have a relationship. They don't know how to relate. They don't know how to express their feelings. They don't even know what they're feeling. They want to have a family because they never had one. They know that, but they don't know what to do with all the anger that they felt while they were away at boarding school. So if they were five or four when they were taken away and then they got to come home at 18, they didn't have any role models. They didn't know where their parents were. They didn't know why their mother didn't come to get them. They didn't know why nobody cared about them. In their view, they were left and a lot of them were very bitter. And it, when, you, when you talk about A scores, a lot of them um, came home exhibiting all the behaviors that we talked about so that they wouldn't feel the way that they did, the drinking and you know whatever was going on, the fighting, the beating the kids, the beating the wife, having lots of babies, because sex feels good too, so people act out sexually. But you get married and then you have 13 kids and then you take everything out on your 13 kids and your wife and so on. So the relationships weren't there. There were no models on how to be a good daddy or how to be a good mom. And so this little girl, we don't know if she's being ignored. We don't know if they're so wrapped up in what they're doing that she's not getting what she needs. So their ACEs, their behavior, their coping mechanisms are becoming her experiences as a child. And so we live that. We still feel that. From what our parents felt, what our grandparents went through, we still feel that. And so getting involved in drugs and alcohol and all of that, it's easy for some of us to then become judgmental. Like, what's wrong with that person? Or tis, tis, tis. They're never going to get it. Doesn't he know better? What the heck is she thinking anyway? So we, we think like that about them instead of considering what the story is and what happened to them. And I tell this over and over because there's no excuse for us anymore because now we know what happened and we shouldn't f be that way anymore. Part of the reason that those, that mother and father are like that was because they had no connection. They were connected to nobody. They felt abandoned. And besides that insult and injury, they were um, abused. No language, no identity know nothing. And then some of the kids that came out of the mush hole didn't even know where they belonged. Some of the ones brought down from the bush didn't even know where home was. They were three or four when they left. How were they supposed to know? How were their parents supposed to get them? So it's really awful. And there's still today, my aunt still today from boarding school can't stand the sound of a ticking clock because she was put in a dark place, being punished, and that's all she could hear was a ticking clock. She can't stand it. So all of those effects are real, and many don't want to talk about it. They don't understand how it relates to today, but those people raise their kids the way they were raised without any tools and often without any support. And so we have parents or grandparents that are still feeling that way and don't know how to hug, don't know how to say I love you. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty devastating, but this isn't about poor us. This is about how do we help each other and what do we do about that and understanding where we came from and why some people have uh, s struggles um, more than others and to have some compassion for them, to extend them some grace, some kindness, and to let them know that they're not alone and that they're still love no matter what. We don't have to love the behavior, but the person, that spirit that's inside should know that they really are um, important and that they're cared about. So the reality is, you know, you, you find out from somebody that they were sexually abused as a child and you can say to them, I see that and I'm sorry that that happened to you. Can you tell me how that's affected your life up until now? And they can tell you, yeah, I'm afraid to get into a relationship. I can't seem to hang on to a relationship. Things are really hard for me. I have a hard time relating to my kids. Like, There's all kinds of things that you could learn about a person. 
So we talk about it over and over and over again to get people comfortable with uncomfortable topics and uncomfortable situations, but they're real and we all live them. We all um, have seen it ourselves in our own lives. And then we um, create safe spaces. And so these spaces, this is a safe space to ask somebody, big brother or the older cousin or somebody, the best buddy can just say, so how'd your day go? What happened anyway? You look so upset. Tell me what happened. And so you can sit there and be calm near the water. I mean, we use the water all the time. We use the water to take things away from us that are negative. You sit by, you listen to the water, you get fed by the waters. There's all kinds of reasons to make a relationship there, but you take what's familiar to you and make those spaces. <clears throat> and this is another place where we can get really judgy about each other. And it shouldn't be that way in terms of being able to make a prayer for, some, for yourself or somebody else, however somebody's comfortable doing it. And whatever we think about the process of how the missionaries came or missionary schools or the boarding schools were run by the churches, whatever that is, there's portions of our communities that are comfortable there and it's a safe place for them. Or you go to Gunasisne. Or you go outside and you sit by the water again and you put tobacco down and you make a prayer for yourself or you listen to somebody and say, how was your day? Or if it's at a sun dance or if it's in a teepee ceremony, whatever it is, we need to be okay with each other and however it is that we want to express ourselves and how we want to pray. We don't have to do it, but just be respectful that people are on the move and they're searching for something. So this sweat lodge that represents our mother's womb, we're back to the beginning again, into that environment where we were. And maybe some of us have to go in there and pray about what the environment was in our womb when we were with our mom before we were born. And think about it and forgive and do whatever process we need to go through to be able to be okay with ourselves. And we leave it there and then we come out and we're new, we're refreshed, we're renewed, we're relieved. And we can attack another day feeling better. So we take whatever it is and we leave it there. Um, in our Ojo Logo, this is, my granddaughter did her four years and her uncle was making her lodge and we're back into the womb again. We're back in a safe place in the middle of the woods with no food, no water, but we're back in our mother's womb where we're safe. So we can take a lot of things back into creation and all these teachings come with it. So it's not a strange place when they, when they get there. And here was a younger one getting ready. Um, for her fast thinking. And, and these kinds of um, spaces that we've taught them about, that we've talked, and, and I teach them about this stuff. I don't hold back. They're 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. They learn this. This is what they learn about. And so it gives them, when they're, when they're 13, do they think about it the same way they do when they're 17? No, it's part of that growth. But it's the same way when you hear all these stories and you, you hear about your um, history, when you're, when you're seven or eight hearing about the creation story, you don't think about it the same way you do when you're 30. Mm -hmm. You start thinking deeper, you go deeper, and that's what these, these kids start to do. And, um, but we take them back to that same place. And this is Louise's slide, um, referring back to those grandmothers, to her grandmother who went to school at the boarding school and how do we fix that? Because it's not gonna be overnight. And by Louise's estimation, it's gonna take us about three generations at least to, to break through that. So somewhere along the line, we have to break that cycle of, of reliving and reenacting that um, trauma that happened because that's what's happening. Those people that suffered that trauma, they reenacted it on their kids. Their kids reenacted what they knew, what they learned, and so on. 
So we reenact things in Ojo Logo. We reenact the creation story. We reenact all kinds of things, the, the canoe ride um, at the end of Ojo Logo. We reenact a lot of things, the, the trip to the water and trying to, you know, teach the girls discipline and not be distracted by the crowd. We, re <coughs> we reenact that. We reenact the garden where um, Yodra Chizo was, um, daughter was buried and we plant, you know, the corn and the beans and all that. So we reenact those things because even though we have epigenetics that have been handed down that change the way we feel about things and see things and trigger us so that a smell or a sound or a, a tone of voice makes us feel uncomfortable or maybe sends us into some kind of anxiety, we still have those other good things that can be tapped and triggered too. Those memories, they're in there. And so we do it, we act it, we carry it out, and we start to instill, reinstill that identity, that self-confidence, that pride. And so, they're, uh, these kids are magnificent. They're not perfect by any means, but they're magnificent in all of that. And if we could have that much patience for each other that we have for them, knowing that we're healing and that we're growing as individuals as well, we would be really um, in good shape. So these were the four years from two years ago fourth years and um, they, it was just tremendous what they what they accomplished so I'm pretty much wrapped up right there I probably forgot stuff because I wing it every time I tell this story be acknowledged for being able to be better you know it's like that child who wants that confirmation that you're a good child, you know. And, and when we didn't get those things, you know, we're, we're devastated. So we carry those, the epigenetic and that behavior over into the next generation. But we can't be afraid to reinvent ourselves. And, and what she does and what I do is, is just our perspective. It doesn't mean that this is written in stone, that you have to believe us, no. But, but if anything, I can encourage you, guajajal, care. Mm -hmm. Care about who we are and don't be afraid to reinvent our story to let it fit into the current conditions that we're living in. And I say this over and over to the kids again is that we have to make our story, stories valid according to the time we're living in. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's so, there's so many things that sometimes we get so stuck on, on our differences than how it is that we are alike. And so in our message and in our, <coughs> in our delivery to our young people is that we try and move them to places of creativity, imagination, um, experience, hands-on, minds-on, getting to that dirt and feel our Mother Earth. You know, and what she was talking about in that, um, that re reenactment of the Mother Earth Garden, as I always say to the, to the young nephews that we're dealing with, you know, uh, I'm going to give you your first sexual experience. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, imagine, <laughs> see, that's the same response I get. But anyways, it's, it's, it's like, but if we can get them at that age to permeate their consciousness with a sense of that woman is earth and earth is a woman. Mm -hmm. Mohi? Maggie? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's mm -hmm. like, if, if he can think about it that way, then that's a universal thought about who he is and what he's connected to. And then perhaps maybe that respect and that compassion and that care for our women will return because we know that we've been kind of disconnected from that for a really long time. And so when we perpetuate these cultural norms within our culture, we have to also critically look at it and to see is that really true? Are we damaging our kids more than we're supporting them? And and there, there's a lot that we throw out there, you know, and so we really got to be able to rethink our narrative. If we want to change our experience as Ogohoi people, to move it from a place of addiction and self-hate to a place of that um, connection. connection and and better life, then we, ha we can't be afraid to change the narrative, to change the experience. And so when we're constantly pummeled, with statistics, and I know that in 
two studies that I just read from 2000, from 1998 to 2008, Truder and Chandler um, did a study of the northern communities of the high rates of suicide in Native communities, and we know that we hear about it all the time here in Ogosasa, up north where they, they're having these youth suicides, is that they found that in communities that had culture, that were given to their children, and, given to, and, they, and they had access to it, and they were welcomed within it, there was almost zero suicide. But then in communities that were a disconnect from who they were, their identity and their connection to the land, to their ancestors, it was really high. So, and that was a study done over 40 different uh, Native communities. So we begin to recognize at the very <coughs> core, underneath level, of what it is that we need to work on in not just ourselves, our families, our communities, and our nationhood. So part of it is all interconnected and you know during this education week, you know, and standing in front of you as a clan mother within our nation, in our Ginyagihaga nation, I can recognize how um, we diminish each other and how the government has created these constructs of division. You know, uh, you're 207, you're that longhouse, you're Catholic, right? you have no clan. You know, so these are human constructs that create, oh, you have to so you have to on daily. You know, oh, you need sadadis. You know, we create these uh, constructs that creates division and then we, we just dig that knife a little further instead of saying, oh, you know, we, we've all come down the same road, the same path. <coughs> so in, instead of condemna condemnation of each other, we should begin to celebrate each other. Say, God, you do it. Say, do a daddy's you go on. Say, do a dadalata you go on. You go on a suma. Say, do a guinness. I do a da jandal and a jimmy do a 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 but I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. And so when we can take a story and transform it into something that is tangible in this day and age, then we're so much better for it. So, you know, this is just a glimpse into some of the stuff, into some of the narrative that we're trying to redo. And, you know, for me, just coming from the standpoint of a woman, and not to diminish at all the men in the room, because we certainly need you, we do, is that we have to look at wholeheartedly. Uh, if we're if we're going to say we're a matrilineal society, then, then then where are we? You know, we got to reestablish our voice. We have to reestablish our um, uh, ourselves as an essential element to the growth and development of our families and our communities and our leadership. We have to be there. Otherwise, the shenanigans do go on. And, you know, kudos to my sister who steps up into leadership. You know, somebody has to do it. We have to be present. This world is run on people who show up. If we're not showing up to control the narrative, then somebody else is writing it for us. 